As we begin this block of topics on how the North Korean state works, I want to make four key points about the popular conceptions of North Korea that we really need to keep in check through our analysis to come. So first, popular discourses tend to view the North Korean state as a monolith and tend not to look beyond the leader. Now, while the leader is always important in authoritarian states, a good international relations analyst never interprets the behavior of a state solely upon the decisions of a single man. This limited perspective lacks appreciation for the complexity of and the constraints imposed by the DPRK's unique institutional structure. Second, Viewing North Korea through black and white or good versus evil binaries doesn't actually tell us anything about how the state works and why it behaves in the way that it does. Binary thinking is intellectually lazy. Now, this doesn't mean that we avoid making a moral judgment about the North Korean regime. Far from it. But it means that we end with the moral judgment based on a detailed understanding of the mechanics of the state, rather than starting with the moral judgment and having little else to say beyond that. Third, there's a tendency in popular discourses to believe that the North Korean state is opaque and that it's really hard to figure out anything about how the North Korean state behaves because of lack of information. Now this hermit kingdom stuff makes for good clickbait but it's simply not accurate. Granted, there are some limitations on what information you can access, as there are with any authoritarian state. However, when it comes to North Korea, we do have multiple sources of information to draw from. As I hope to demonstrate to you over the coming weeks, the underlying premises of North Korean government behavior are reasonably clear, consistent and observable once you're beyond, once you move beyond opacity as your starting assumption. And finally, there's a tendency in popular media to claim that the Kims are irrational and crazy, which is what I call the madman thesis. And you can see, see evidence of the madman thesis illustrated here in this image of Kim Jong Il from the 2004 movie Team America World Police. Look here. While there's a long and wonderful tradition of comedic caricature of political leaders, if caricature is our only frame of reference for understanding the Kims and for understanding North Korea, we're likely to misrepresent and misunderstand what's going on there. Now, again, this doesn't mean that we need to like Kim Jong-un or we need to like North Korea, not at all merely that we need to evaluate them as human beings with interests and motivations and with biases and baggage. This is what good IR analysts do. So please keep these four points in mind as we do our deep dive into North Korea over the coming weeks. So with that in mind, let's commence our journey into the inner workings of the DPRK state, beginning with its political system. In this video, I'll outline the formal institutional structure of the North Korean state. I'll explain how the Workers' Party of Korea operates both in parallel and within that institutional structure. I'll identify where the Korean People's Army sits in this political system. And I'll introduce some of the key coercive institutions that project and protect the power of the leadership across North Korean society. On paper, the North Korean political hierarchy is structured as a multi-party democratic system with executive, legislative and judicial branches of government. And this is the structure that we see illustrated in the simple organisational flowchart above. Now, in practice, we know that that's not quite accurate. At best, it's a misrepresentation and at worst, it's wildly inaccurate about how the system operates. But that's not to say that this structure is unimportant. It demonstrates that the DPRK is not just a monolith and that there's more to government in North Korea than just the Kims. There are divisions of jurisdictional responsibility. There are internal factions and power struggles. 
There are bureaucratic processes and careers to be won and lost for the officials within that bureaucracy. So this is a dynamic space and it behooves us as North Korea analysts to try and make sense of what's going on in that space. In practice, power in the North Korean political system is heavily centralised with the leader. And this is what you would expect in an authoritarian political system. In the machinery of the state, this centralised power is maintained by the leader by taking leadership positions in critical institutions across the government along with a small elite of trusted officials who are doing the same thing. Three generations of Kims have held the position of Supreme Leader in North Korea since Korea's liberation from Japanese colonial rule. So the first leader, Kim Il-sung, who we've met previously, was the founding father of North Korea. He ruled from 1948 until his death in 1994. He was succeeded by his son, Kim Jong-il, who served for 17 years until a fatal heart attack in late 2011. Leadership then passed to the current leader, Kim Jong-un, who came to power in 2012 at the young age of 26. Each of these three leaders have exercised power through authoritarian centralisation although each of them has reconfigured the institutions of the state in their own way to suit the circumstances that they found themselves in. This is an organisational chart of the DPRK government, which is published and regularly updated by the international news website NK Pro. And you can access NK Pro uh, getting their subscriber level content through the library's website, and it's a great resource, thoroughly recommended. I know this graphic is a little bit hard to see here uh, because there's so much going on, but I've included a PDF version of this on LMS so you can examine it in closer detail and zoom in uh, on the people and on the, the information that's included here. Now, just to untangle what's on here, the boxes in blue at the top, this represents the Legislative Assembly, which is the legislative branch of the DPRK government. Below that is the judiciary in the grey boxes on the left, which includes the Supreme Court and the Supreme Public Prosecutor's Office. The green box is the cabinet, which oversees the ministries and commissions. And this is kind of like the public service arm of the DPRK government. The purple box represents the State Affairs Commission, which is essentially North Korea's supreme policy making body. And in practice, this is North Korea's executive branch of government, which has Kim Jong-un at its head. So let's have a look at each of these main bodies in a little bit more detail. So let's start with the Supreme People's Assembly or the Legislative Assembly. And this is considered the highest organ of state power as written in the North Korean constitution. Now the Supreme People's Assembly usually convenes once or twice a year at Pyongyang's Mansade Assembly Hall, which is pictured here. And you'll often see this in photographs uh, related to North Korean politics in the media. This consists of 687 delegates that represent every electoral district in North Korea. Its constitutionally defined role is to discuss, create and amend new laws and appoint key leadership positions in the cabinet and other branches of the DPRK government. The constitution provides for the Supreme People's Assembly to be elected every five years by universal suffrage. Now, I can see your eyebrows raising here at the talk of elections, and rightly so. In reality, as we know, North Korea is anything but democratic. It's an authoritarian system in which power at the top of the hierarchy is heavily centralized within the role of the leader. There are elections. But of course, they're rigged, they're for show. It's what puts the illusion of democratic in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The real exercise of power cuts across the institutional structure. So what does this mean? It means the organs of the state have both de jure functions on paper and de facto or actual functions in reality, to use the legal terms. 
So in practice, the Supreme People's Assembly doesn't have much real power. It's more of a rubber stamp parliament that gives legitimacy to whatever's already been decided by Kim Jong-un and the Workers' Party of Korea. So to return to your raised eyebrow, why have a pretend democratic body in a country that's so obviously authoritarian? That's worth exploring. These institutions were imports from the Soviet political system, which traced their lineage back to the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Now, at the time of that revolution in 1917, the Russian communists did have popularly elected legislative bodies, which were called Soviets at the local, regional and national levels. So this is where the Soviet comes from in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Now, while any real democracy in the Soviet Union was very fleeting after the conclusion of the Bolshevik Revolution, the legitimizing mythology of the people was maintained superficially in the structure of these governing institutions in the USSR. This institutional model was then exported to other countries around the world where communist governments came to power, including North Korea. So, the Supreme People's Assembly in the DPRK is a relic of this history. Let's move on now to the State Affairs Commission. So the State Affairs Commission's authority is set up by the DPRK constitution, and it's roughly analogous to the United States executive branch, with the chairman equivalent to the president of the US. So we can see in the graphic here, the chairman is Kim Jong-un. In theory, the State Affairs Commission reports to the Supreme People's Assembly. However, the legal checks and balances that are built into the Constitution have no actual authority, authority in practice. You know, in real life, the State Affairs Commission functions as the DPRK's supreme decision-making body with Kim Jong-un at its top. Members of the State Affairs Commission hold important positions of power within the DPRK. So just to be a member of the State Affairs Commission, these people have to have the confidence and support of Kim Jong-un. Although that confidence is not always permanent. So these people can be purged at any given time. While high-ranking party positions do result from power struggles within the regime. To get up to here on the State Affairs Commission, this reflects the relationships that have been built up with Kim Jong-un, as well as Kim Jong-un's policy priorities at a given time. So if Kim Jong-un's policy priorities change, then the composition of the State Affairs Commission is also likely to change with those who reflect old ideas being moved off and those who embody new ideas or the new directions that Kim wants to go will find themselves on the commission. All State Affairs Commission members also hold key positions within the state bureaucracy, which is another way that power is centralised across the institutions of state. So not only does Kim Jong-un hold multiple positions across different bodies in the machinery of the state, but these men on the State Affairs Commission do as well for the same reasons. Let's look at the cabinet now. So the cabinet and its subordinate state ministries are generally the technocratic or administrative arms of the state. So like I said before, they're like the North Korea's public service. They're charged with the running of the machinery of the state, of carrying out policies and directives of the Supreme Leader and the Workers' Party of Korea. While the cabinet obviously operates under the directive of Kim Jong-un and the State Affairs Commission, it's not just a rubber stamp body like the Supreme People's Assembly. And this is particularly pertinent to the economy. So the cabinet has primary responsibility for running the economy. And keep this in mind when I discuss the operation of the command economy in a later video, because it's the cabinet that oversees the central planning process. Key economic officials have consistently been placed at the cabinet's helm. Uh, and when these key people are removed, that generally coincides directly with changes in North Korea's economic policy and when new directions are taken. So 
And that's a really important point uh, about how change manifests within the North Korean political system is that when you see people removed and new people brought in, that's a very clear indicator that there's a, a change of direction happening, not necessarily just for punishment for doing something wrong. But it does mean that officials who rise to the rank of ministers in the cabinet, they are working in a high stakes environment. All one party authoritarian states struggle to find a balance between loyalty and competency when filling the ranks of government. And the members of the cabinet in the DPRK are subject to intense scrutiny from internal security forces, as, as well as the usual performance pressures. Having responsibility for the real world problems of administering a country while also demonstrating loyalty to the prerogatives of the leadership is a very fine line to tread for these officials, particularly when what's coming down from the leadership is not always logical from an operational standpoint. It's also worth saying something about the judicial arm of government in the DPRK. So here, in terms of the flow chart I showed you earlier, this includes the Supreme Court and the Supreme Public Prosecutor's Office. Although the entire, entirety of the judiciary incorporates other subnational bodies as well. But it is important to note that the legal system in North Korea operates much differently to how we'd understand the legal system here in Australia. The role of the judicial, the role of the judiciary and the legal system in North Korea is political and ideological. It developed that way with influences from the Soviet legal system, but also with influences from the laws of the Japanese colonial administration and traditional legal norms from pre-colonial Chosun. So it's a bit of a hybrid. North Korean laws are vague and they're open to, to interpretation. And they contain little in the way of detailed legal codification pertaining to rules, oversight or penalties for transgression. So there are some uh, texts of laws that, are, that you can find and, and read from North Korea and absolutely nothing like a legal text that you'd find here. The courts in North Korea share responsibility with other institutions from the security apparatus in educating and disciplining and punishing citizens. But they share this responsibility with local people's committees, or like the party cells, with work units where people are employed, uh, and other organisations within the state perform this function as well. So on the whole, the judiciary represents the interests of the state. And the legal process generally is geared around political education and confession rather than justice. The Workers' Party of Korea is a separate and parallel political organisation and bureaucracy as opposed to the institutions of the state. So this sits beside and integrates across all of the bodies that we just looked at in the previous section. Party members are integrated into the institutions of the government that I outlined earlier. So, you know, the people employed here will also have roles in these other bodies as well. Now, the party's role is purely political. It's to communicate the ideas and the policies of the leader. It's to educate the people about those ideas and policies. The party ensures compliance with those ideas and policies and tries to ensure loyalty throughout the institutions of the state and North Korean society at large. This flowchart shows the key organs within the Korean Workers' Party. And again, I know this graphic's hard to see, but I have included the PDF version of this on LMS. And you can also follow the link on the slide uh, to NK Pro to the original to look at this in more detail. For a bit of history, the Korean Workers' Party was established under close Soviet guidance in 1945. And it was established to provide a working bureaucracy for the fledgling Korean communists to consolidate their power. So remember, 1945 at that time, you've got that post-colonial power vacuum. So there is no bureaucracy. If you're trying to set up a 
an alternative go- alternative government, you need a bureaucracy for that government. So this was the, the original intent of the Korean Workers' Party. Again, it's an imported model from the USSR, and the party's based on the Stalinist model of Communist Party organization. Like the USSR, the symbol of the Korean Workers' Party has a hammer and sickle, which symbolizes the industrial workers and the peasants of the proletarian revolution. Uniquely though, the Korean Workers' Party symbol also includes a calligrapher's brush symbolizing the intelligentsia. And that harks back to the key role of nationalist Korean intellectuals in the formation of the DPRK. But it's also ironic given the anti-intellectualism and the purges uh, of the intelligentsia that have happened in North Korea pretty much ever since the 1950s. To see how the Workers' Party of Korea is organised, let's start at the bottom of the hierarchy and work our way to the top of its bureaucracy. This flowchart here, this is published by the website NK Leadership Watch, and this shows us how the hierarchy works. So using this, we'll go through each level in turn. Again, I've included a link to this chart on LMS so you can analyze it in more detail or follow the link on the slide here to the original. Let's start at the grassroots with the party cells. These are small local groups of five to 30 party members and also including candidate party members, so people that want to join the party. The party cell is where individual people are indoctrinated into the party line and its policies. Party cells are also embedded into government agencies as well as into the military and security forces and the country's cultural organizations. It's within the party cell, within the party cell where people submit their applications for membership into the party. Uh, and you do need a referral of two existing members in order to get in. The party cell is also the venue in which all party and candidate party members are subject to evaluations of their individual party life, which is called party life critique. And this is similar to the rituals of self-criticism or struggle sessions that were performed by cadres in many communist countries. And I'll talk more about self-criticism a bit later on in another video. Moving up the bureaucratic hierarchy, the city and county party committees are the local arm of the party's administrative power for getting things done. Each of North Korea's 28 cities, or C, has a city party committee, as do each of its 145 counties, or kun. City and county party committees are responsible for managing municipal and county government work. They're responsible for conducting public affairs and cultural activities, as well as managing the affairs of the party cells and basic party organizations that are located within their jurisdiction. The city and county party committees report to provincial party committees. And there's a provincial party committee for each of North Korea's nine provinces and three directly governed cities. Provincial party committees are responsible for the following functions. They manage party government work. They mobilize party cadres and party organizations within the provinces. They ensure party guidance over political, economic and cultural activities. They conduct public affairs and cultural activities. And they provide guidance for the province's chapters of reserve military trading units. Moving on up the hierarchy, the Central Committee of the Korean Workers' Party is the party's chief policy-making body. So it's got the power to approve political and ideological campaigns, and it deliberates and advises on government policies. The Central Committee also vets and approves personnel appointments in the cabinet and the party, as well as military promotions. So that's the, that specific power is where you see the party's ability to integrate party members into the different bodies of the state so that the party can exercise its ideological functions through the, the constitutionally defined machinery of the state. There's three important institutions that are directly subordinate to the Central Committee. So there's the Political Bureau or Politburo, which is responsible for managing policy and ideology. There's the Central 
Control Committee, which regulates party membership and disciplinary matters. And there's the Secretariat, which is responsible for implementing and enforcing the party's decisions through its many subordinate departments. Interestingly, Kim Jong-un is the chairman of each of these bodies. So again, you can see the centralization of control of the leadership extends into the party as well. This satellite image on slide, this is published by NK Leadership Watch, and it shows the Workers' Party of Korea's Central Committee office complex in Pyongyang. And it gives you an indication of the party's vast bureaucracy. And this is only one side of many uh, across the country. Looking at this organizational chart, and I swear this is the last organizational flow chart I'll show you in this video. This is compiled by scholars at Johns Hopkins University in the US. But it's illustrative because it shows how the institutions of the state and the institutions of the Korean Workers' Party are linked together with Kim Jong-un occupying leadership positions in the primary bodies of both. This is how power is centralized with the leader in what's otherwise a quite large and complex bureaucracy. And this is how an authoritarian leader consolidates power within the institutions of the state. By this point of the video, you're probably wondering, what about the people holding the guns? This is an authoritarian country, right? Well, in any state, the military is always a key institution. Militaries are the guarantors of state sovereignty, both externally and internally. And their support for the political system and its leadership is critical to stability. This holds even more true in authoritarian states like North Korea. And it's why the Korean People's Army is front and center in the politics of the DPRK. So whenever you see Kim Jong-un in public, in making public appearances, there's always military officials in their formal uniforms covered in stars and badges there with him um, because of the importance of the military and how the state runs. North Korea is a garrison state. It's a militarized society. The DPRK's Korean People's Army has one of the largest standing armies in the world with approximately 1.2 million troops on active duty and another 7 million more in reserve. The importance of the KPA harks back to the early 1960s and Kim, jo uh, sorry, Kim Il-sung's decision to turn North Korea into a veritable fortress. So we have got to ask, why is North Korea such a militarized state in which the military has become the ideological and organizational backbone of the society? How did that originate? Well, during the early 1960s, international events such as the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Sino-Soviet split led Kim Il-sung to place a renewed emphasis on national security and the strengthening of national self-defense. So this doctrine, which at the time was called the Equal Emphasis Policy, called for the fortification of the country and the arming of the entire nation, along with the modernization of the KPA into an elite fighting force. And that's an elite fighting force by 1960s standards. But important to note here is the emphasis on the militarization of the whole society, not just the modernization of the KPA. According to the security and intelligence website, globalsecurity.org, North Korea has approximately 7 million people mobilized in reserve military units. So this is people not on active duty, it's like the equivalent of Australia's army reserve. Now there are three primary units into which reservists are organized in North Korea. One is the reserve military training unit, this consists of about 1.7 million people, including men between the ages of 17 and 45 and unmarried women between the ages of 17 and 30. Another body is the worker peasant militia. And this is a force of about 4.1 million people. It's a combination of predominantly older men aged between 45 to 60 with some younger men and unmarried women included as well. And finally, there's the Young Red Guards, which are 
consists of about 1.2 million male and female high school students aged between 14 and 16. However, we shouldn't be fooled by the raw numerical size of the KPA. Don't believe the hype. A large proportion of its troops are not combat ready at any given time. Now, why is this? Well, because many of them are mobilized for agricultural labor or civilian construction projects. So like this group of KPA soldiers illustrated here, they're off to dig ditches on farms and stuff. They are not combat ready. So the raw numbers are deceiving. Here, though, I'm more concerned with the Korean People's Army's institutional position in the machinery of the DPRK state, rather than its material warfighting capabilities. A military of this size and importance to the maintenance of the authoritarian system is inevitably a player in the institutional politics of the state. And that's a reality that's not at all lost on the leadership. Officially, the KPA is responsible directly to the State Affairs Commission and indirectly to the cabinet. However, in North Korea, the military, the internal security apparatus and the cabinet all play a supporting role to enact the vision of the Workers' Party of Korea and thus the leader. So the military and the party are fused very closely. The military has a general political bureau that's staffed by political commissars from the party who issue instructions from the party among the branches of the Korean People's Army. Career progression for military, military officials is also at stake. So even in the KPA, one needs to be a party member in order to rise further up the ranks. So this integration of the KPA into the formal hierarchy of the state as well as through its enmeshment with the Workers' Party of Korea, is another way that the leadership maintains control over the military. We've discussed the leadership, the institutions of the state, the Workers' Party of Korea, and the Korean People's Army. But where do the rest of the North Korean people fit into its political system? This is a really important question. We can understand this by looking at North Korea's complex and highly stratified class system, which shapes decisions about who gets access to what in North Korea. And that access is made on the basis of the political reliability and the family background of the individuals concerned. So this system is known as the Songbun class system, but it's not a class system in the classic Marxist sense of the concept, although there is some correlation. It's got more to do with the social position of people's family members during the formative years of the DPRK in the 1940s and 1950s. So within the Songbun system, the population is divided into 51 different social groupings, which can be simplified and summarized through three broad categories. So first, you've got the core class, which consists of the family descendants of the party members, soldiers and industrial proletarians. Then you've got the wavering class. So this incorporates the family descendants of middle ranking peasants, small business owners and traders. What in Marxist parlance would be known as the petty bourgeoisie. Then you've got the hostile class. So this includes family descendants of well-to-do peasants, individuals re with religious affiliations, the intelligentsia, and returning Chinese and Japanese Koreans. So these are the, who you'd interpret as yeah, the class traders from an official perspective. The graphic here on the slide illustrates the relative size of each class group along with their relative access to services and advancement from the state. The Songwon system influences employment prospects and also influences access to housing and higher education, to healthcare and food supplies and party membership. Indeed, this is the framework through which the Workers' Party of Korea manages the day-to-day -day politics of life at the local level. Looking at the coercive institutions of the state, there's a couple that are quite important here. 
First, we've got the Ministry of Social Security, which is the primary body that's responsible for internal security and basic police functions, including the maintenance of law and order, common criminal investigation, prison management, civil re registrations, background checking, travel control. Uh, so that's important for restrictions on movement. Protection of party officials and the safekeeping of classified government documents, as well as government building security. So they cover a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, that would more or less fit under the rubric of common law and order. But it also oversees social controls under five mutually reinforcing categories of residence, travel, employment, and food and clothing. And so that's the kind of discrimination you see that's based in the Songbun class system. That's Songbun in action right there. More notorious, though, is the Ministry of State Security, which is the DPRK's chief security and intelligence agency and the leading coercive body of the North Korean state. So this is the secret police that's tasked with enforcing the party's ideological system through surveillance and investigations of political and economic crimes. So you don't want these guys knocking on your door. That's nothing but bad news. And if you go back to the, the NK Pro leadership organogram earlier in the video, you'll see that these two ministries report directly to the State Affairs Commission. So what are the lessons that we can take from the North Korean case that are relevant in other contexts? One, well, no state is a monolith. Every state has a unique political system that operates within its own bureaucratic structure. How power is exercised in any given state depends on how that structure works, both on paper and in practice. And to understand the behavior of any state, this is the complexity that we need to untangle. Second, formal institutional hierarchies are not always how things get done or how power is exercised. And this is a lesson that applies in the context of any bureaucratic hierarchy. And finally, in a bureaucratic hierarchy, career advancement for individuals is often based on demonstrating commitment to the party line not necessarily good performance or right action. And that there's always a price to pay for non-compliance if you step out of line. In your revisions for the assessments, keep these key themes in mind.